Um, I was going to have a, a very small PowerPoint, two slides actually. We couldn't really get it working, so I will be the PowerPoint at a, <laughs> at a certain time. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, so, for those of you who weren't here yesterday, um, what I'm doing is exactly what I'm against, uh, which is I'm being very undialectical. Um, and so yesterday I talked about the crisis. I talked about um, austerity urbanism. I talked about the massive attack on black urban spaces, black schools in particular, uh, some Latino schools, um, and uh, disenfranchisement. That's part of the current education um, move agenda um, in um, major cities, one of them being the one that I live in, which is a pioneer of that of this. And so today I, I want to talk about counter-hegemonic possibilities, not as a, sort of some rosy illusions up here of the kind of world that we wish we had. But concretely, I'm, I'm trying to make an analysis of what is actually concretely happening. And so what are the concrete possibilities? So yesterday I argued <coughs> that the policy of massive school closings, expropriation of black public space, disposability, and disenfranchisement constitutes coercive urban governance by exclusion. The success of this strategy depends on the state's ability to contain and divert the collective resistance to these policies by those people who are targeted, and on sustaining broad consent, or at least silence, and therefore com <laughs> complicity. Yet the effects of the crisis and the state's move to socialize the losses of investors through a politics of urban austerity presents a challenge to neoliberal hegemony in general. The crisis has created an opening for multiple discourses about its causes and solutions, as Oosterlink and Gonzalez say, and therefore for the possibility of counter-hegemonic resistance. A number of political analysts have asked, um, not surprisingly, um, maybe we've asked, is the right better position to capitalize on the crisis than the left? Mm. And on the surface, it would <laughs> certainly seem so. Um, the ascendancy of the right is apparent in basically every social sphere, um, as I talked about yesterday and ones I didn't talk about yesterday, with neoliberals capitalizing on the crisis to accelerate education privatization and the radical restructuring of black urban space. So today I want to examine the dialectics of this process, focusing on the contradictions and failures of neoliberal policies, the fissures in hegemonic alliances, and the possibilities of a counter-hegemonic movement of the left in education. In part, my discussion is framed by the writings of critical geographers, as usual, um, who describe neoliberalism as a crisis-driven, uneven, contested process of policy experimentation and reinvention that is nevertheless institutionally and culturally embedded at all scales. So this is really important. Um, because it's about not reifying neoliberalism or seeing it as a thing or even seeing it as a seamless, smooth process, but by seeing as, it as something that was a response to crisis and is crisis-ridden. Neoliberalism evolved as a fix for the structural crisis of capitalism. Let's not forget that. And it has lurched forward, as Peck and Theodore put it. Uh, they describe it as a crisis-induced and crisis-producing process driven by a relentless search for economic growth. For example, neoliberal urban growth strategies that rely on debt financing, financialization, and real estate investment triggered the financial crisis of 2008. So a fix for the structural crisis of capitalism is, and that was just one of many fixes. Uh, we could talk about the dot-com crisis or others but actually triggered the financial crisis of 2008 and the ensuing urban fiscal crisis, which I talked about yesterday and, and problematized. Um, and it's t in response to this, city governments are responding by cutting police and firefighters, slashing public employee wages and benefits, closing libraries and schools, and foregoing infrastructure repairs and maintenance. These austerities, on top of three decades of what Jamie Peck calls the cumulative incapacitation of the state, undermine social stability and certainly have economic and so social costs. The wave of urban privatizations of public infrastructure and public goods is mortgaging the future just to pay debt service and keep the lights on. 
I gave the example of Chicago's Mayor Daley leasing the Skyway and the, and the parking meters. Uh, and I actually talked about this in more detail yesterday because um, it really <laughs> illustrates this point. But he, he leased both of these long-term leases to a consortia of transnational investors. And what he said was that um, this was going to be a source of long-term revenue for Chicago, really be helpful for Chicago. Instead, he used the funds to fix um, budget shortfalls. The city lost an estimated $12 billion in revenue and has foregone revenues until 2084. As part of the parking meter deal, meter rates increased from 25 cents an hour, I guess you know this, in 2008, 25 cents an hour in most Chicago neighborhoods, and there were not meters in many Chicago neighborhoods, including the one I live in, the rates increased to $2 an hour in 2013 and $6 downtown. So this basically infuriated everyone. Um, some people applied baseball bats and uh, um, hey, super glue to the meters. Where was Paul Newman? As a You're right. Of fact, <laughs> right. I was not involved in that. Um, and but what it did also was it created a common reference point for people in Chicago about the privatization of of public goods. Social austerity and privatization on an already neoliberalized terrain also hold the potential to undermine neoliberalism's hegemonic appeal. The resulting social instability and deepened inequality can produce further fascization and social suffering, which is actually what we're seeing. Or it could spawn possibility for a counter-hegemonic movement. And so I'm going to use this framework to look at contradictions post what I'm calling post-crisis. Um, I don't know why I'm calling it post-crisis, since we're in the crisis. But post-2008 crisis, um, education policies. The fissures in hegemony, these moves open up, and possibilities of a counter-hegemonic movement. And again, as I said yesterday, um, I took um, my hosts at, face, at their word uh, when they said that we don't want to hear your old work that you've already done. We want to hear new work in progress. So I'm inflicting new work that's really in progress on you. So I really welcome your critiques. Um, I, I mean that very seriously. It will help me sharpen my own thinking. So I'm going to focus on Chicago. And I know people are really sick of hearing me talk about Chicago. Um, and um, But there's a reason why I'm focusing on Chicago um, in relation to this particular talk. And I'll get to that in a minute. Um, you know, Chicago was, was a birthplace of all these neoliberal education policies. And it's now a center of the pushback against it. So the dialectic that I'm talking about is very kind of concentrated and crystallized in Chicago. Chicago's high stakes testing was a prototype for No Child Left Behind, Chicago's Renaissance 2010 policy to close public schools and um, expand charter schools was really a prototype for um, some of the key um, planks of the uh, Obama administration's race to the top um, national agenda. Um, Chicago was a pioneer of appointing corporate CEOs to run school districts. Chicago's mayoral takeover of the schools in 1995 really became a model nationally for mayoral takeovers of school districts. Um, and you know, Arne Duncan, who was Chicago's CEO of schools from 2001 to 2008, crisscrossed the country touting the Chicago miracle. So this kind of, Chicago kind of discursively established the efficacy of all these policies, even though there was actually very little evidence to support them. Nonetheless, Chicago provided the credentials to catapult Duncan to head up the US Department of Education. But Chicago is now a center of the pushback against this agenda. And that's, that is why I'm focusing on it, because I think it really does, uh, it's really worth looking at it and examining it. And I'm going to talk later about what I think we can and can't learn from Chicago, because I'm not saying it's, we can generalize from it. Um, but I do think that it helps us talk about the dialectic of the crisis, the failures of neoliberalism, um, some realignment of social groups that produce possibilities, progressive possibilities. And I, I want to say that this talk um, in particular, yesterday too, but especially this one, it really draws on uh, not just my research, but my participation in all these struggles in Chicago um, from um, fighting. Um, so, I mean, I'm not 
interested in telling you everything I've done. But let me just say that because I've been involved in the struggles, um, at first against high stakes testing, and then against the school closing since 2004, in alliance with um, and collaboration with um, community organizations and parents, um, especially through teachers <coughs> for social justice that I'm part of, that um, and then through the campaign for the elected school board that we have right now, which I will talk about, that um, um, what I have to say is this is an epistemological question. Um, that what I have to say is is really kind of collective knowledge, I think. Um, it's not my, my knowledge. It's knowledge that we've constructed together over time. And so I don't, of course, I have to take responsibility for my own ideas and my own interpretations. But um, I, I do want to say that it's grounded in what a lot of people have been struggling with and thinking about for a while. Um, Chicago's transition from, a, from an industrial Keynesian welfare state city, sorry, to a global city has not been smooth, counter to popular opinion, nor should it be considered complete, counter to popular opinion. The city's reliance on real estate and debt financing um, definitely took a hit in 2008, and it's continuing to rely on debt, on real estate and debt financing. This destabilization produced by regressive redistribution and the cumulative weakening of the social state have taken an enormous toll on black and Latino communities, especially on black communities. And they're really coming back to haunt the city as a whole. In the Bronzeville area, which has been ground zero for school closings in many respects, also ground zero for the destruction of public housing and gentrification, homicide rates increased 300% from 2006 to 2012, prompting President Obama to come to Chicago. A headline in the February 16th, 2013 Chicago Tribune read, quote, gun violence inflicts scar on Chicago's image, end quote. So the real violence, of course, is the violence that's, the everyday violence, the violence that's produced through poverty and destabilization and um, appropriation of people's homes and so forth. Um, and um, and so the, the Tribune is concerned about it only when it puts a, um, a bad face on Chicago, but Chicago is a global city and it can't afford that bad face. So that's the, the context for this. <laughs> Chicago's aggressive use of tax increment financing, which is a whole entire story that I could probably spend a whole two hours talking about, um, has enabled real estate developers and investors to siphon off millions of tax dollars designated for schools, libraries, and parks. At the end of 2011, there was a 1.39 billion slush fund, TIF slush, slush fund in the city. Yet the city claimed a budget deficit of 636 million and a school budget deficit of 1 billion, which is highly contested. Um, and, you know, is, is proposing to close 140 schools, as I said yesterday, most of black communities. Um, so, now I want to just stop for a minute and talk about the national context to come back to Chicago. Nationally, we are also seeing cumulative failures and fallouts from the radical restructuring of public education that began under Reagan. No child left behind, based on the logic that you can fatten a pig by putting it on a scale, <laughs> has had to undergo several revisions of its impossible goal of 100% of students, um, the statisticians in the room would tell us, possible goal of reaching, reaching or exceeding proficiency in state benchmarks by 2014. As the punitive effects of this policy rolled out, there was and is cheating at all scales, um, inevitably, because people's schools, jobs, lives depend on making those scores. Um, and the long-term effects are being felt, and I don't know if you're seeing this here, although we were talking about this this morning. Um, um, but the long-term effects of 12 years of a test prep diet for students is really being felt at the university level. Mm -hmm. um, at least I'm seeing it. Where students um, have not really had the experience of being able to think about ideas, um, where students have not um, had the opportunity to get much behind looking for right answers in a, in a passage that they're reading. And so their, their ability to write, 
and to think about these things is really curtailed. Mm -hmm. and, and so they're really handicapped when they get to the university. And so we're seeing those, those rollout effects. There is actually a national backlash against excessive testing um, that has been crystallized in the refusal of teachers at Garfield High School in, in Seattle. Um, who were, by the way, it wasn't just teachers. They were backed up by parents and by students. To, um, they refused to give the MAP test, which is a high-stakes test um, that measures teachers. So there are these fallouts from neoliberal education policies nationally. My own research chronicles how school closings, charter expansion, and high-stakes testing are driving out some of the most committed and accomplished teachers, undermining the pool of expertise in the teaching force and destabilizing communities. School closings have generated persistent vocal resistance centered in African American and some Latino organizations um, in Chicago, in New York, in Philadelphia, there was a sit-in mm. uh, at City Hall in Philadelphia yesterday around school closings. Um, and that these organizations are beginning to link up. And I, I mentioned yesterday the Journey for Education Justice, which is a coalition of African American parents and students in 20 <coughs> uh, cities that are filing a civil rights suit against mm. the um, Department of Education. So, um, so this is some of the sort of fallout, in other words, in which neoliberal education experiments, because they are experiments, have um, created their own contradictions and their own failures and resistance. So um, now I want to do a kind of anatomy of this dialectic in Chicago, which I think is um, an advanced case of, as I said, of both the effects of these policies and the resistance to them. And um, I want to start by just talking about hegemony for a minute. So, um, as I'm sure everyone in this room knows, um, Michael Apple has written authoritatively about the construction of a hegemonic neoliberal, neoconservative social block in education. And I'm definitely not going to rehearse his argument, especially Michael sitting right here. Um, However, um, what I do want to say is that um, a hegemonic block, as, as I think we all know, but just to remind ourselves, is constructed by a leading class recruiting other classes, class fractions, social groups, to its agenda, its values, <coughs> its goals. And although these, these, this constellation of forces is united around uh, some central ideas, there are always tensions within that hegemonic block. And that's very important to my analysis today. Neoliberal hegemony um, in education, in part, is constructed by recruiting some, um, what are sometimes called subaltern groups, to its agenda. And it does this by mobilizing the good sense in, Gramscian's, uh, in the Gramscian sense to, um, in neoliberalism. And so Michael has also written about this. And so what this is not, um, I want to be, be very clear, this is not about social dupes. This is not about people who somehow get hoodwinked into the market. Um, it comes out of a, um, a very deep reality, which is that the public has not served some people well. In fact, the public has been very exclusionary. Public schools have been racist. <laughs> I mean, let's just. They've been racist, they've been very inequitable, they've been extremely unresponsive um, to communities of color, to working class people. Um, we are, some, some of us in this room are some of the biggest critics of public schools. And people have fought over and over to try to get some change in those schools. So it's quite reasonable to um, use the market as a way to get some remedy. Um, a remedy is needed and it's an avenue to get a remedy. So when we think about a hegemonic alliance as recruiting subaltern groups, um, we don't want to think about it as a one-way agency. Uh, but we want to think about it, I think, as a two-way agency. Um, that the people who are recruited are also recruiting, if you will, um, in order to um, meet some particular needs. And Tom Padroni has written about this in terms of the, um, the voucher movement in Milwaukee. So in the new political, as an example, in the new political economy, I talk about the good sense in charter schools for African-American and Latino parents whose children attend disinvested, 
punitive, destabilized schools with a constricted curriculum, um, which is produced by all these other policies, the high stakes testing and, and all of that, right? And so these, these policies produce the conditions that um, create a, actually a charter school market. They produced a charter school market. So, but in our interviews with charter school parents, they were not big proponents of the market. They were not ideologically aligned with this agenda. They didn't say, we love the market and choice, and we think the public is bad. In fact, a lot of them were parents who talked about how great their, how great their African American public school was in a segregated Chicago, which it still is, et cetera, but how they can't get an education for the kids now. So um, they were basically acting on a terrain not of their own making and in the absence of an alternative. The weakness of the hegemonic, one weakness of the hegemonic strategy is that the consent of subordinated classes and social groups depends in part on the state um, cultivating expectations that it cannot meet. One reason why the crisis creates an, so this is one reason why the crisis creates an opening. Because the expectations that people have had and even the standard of living that people have had is no longer possible under the crisis. So sense legitimation may not be enough to win broad allegiance to a hegemonic agendas when the lived experience of austerity budgets means the state cannot deliver on a way of life to which people are accustomed and to which they aspire, including those fractions of the middle and working classes it has recruited to its values and goals. Hegemony also relies on the absence of a counter-hegemonic program that might win over certain fractions. So I talked about um, black charter school parents in, in, in Chicago that we interviewed, they really didn't see any other options. So it's also in the absence of, of an alternative. Um, right. Yeah, right. So um, in, the, in the 1990s, um, Mayor, so I want to talk about now, I'm shifting, I want to talk, or I'm continuing or something, I want to talk about um, the hegemonic alliance in Chicago and how it was formed and who is in it without the PowerPoint. In the 1990s, Chicago Mayor Daley launched a plan to restructure public education in Chicago that was constitutive of his global city agenda, and I've written about this. That agenda was driven by corporate and financial sectors of capital that were generally, I, let's call them generally represented in the commercial club of Chicago, not exclusively, but we'll use the commercial club of Chicago as a, 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 a very, accurate placeholder. In a bid to support gentrification, market the city to global business services and financial sectors, and recruit middle class families to the city, Daly's appointed school board, which is also made up of CEOs and real estate people and bankers, expanded selective enrollment and specialty schools in gentrified and affluent neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And because there were magnet schools, you, could you had to apply to get in. So of course, some working class people um, some people who didn't live in those neighborhoods were able to get in, but it was a tiny fraction. So we have stories about kids living on the southwest side of Chicago going to uh, Northside College Prep, which is on the northwest side of Chicago, by taking two trains and two buses and getting up at 4.30 in the morning. There are those cases, okay? But the general idea was to provide this sort of upper tier of elite schools that would satisfy and bring back the middle class to the city. These new world-class schools systematically ensured educational advantages for the primarily white middle class, more or less winning their allegiance to whatever CPS was doing. So CPS, at the same time, was doing other things, actually intensifying inequities in the school system as a whole. But this initiative was satisfying um, a small but extremely influential group of parents and satisfying this larger political economic agenda for the city. So at the same time that CPS was doing this, they were intensifying high stakes accountability on neighborhood schools in African American and Latino communities. And these policies led to a revolving door of mostly disastrous curricula, including script and instruction, teacher performance systems, district reorganizations, top-down directives, um, really a destabilizing, disinvesting, um, dispiriting set of policies in those schools. 
the um, schools in black and Latino communities, especially black communities, were stripped of support staff and lacked resources of all kinds. Schools that had, um, that lost their truancy person. This is the person who goes out and knocks on kids' doors and finds out, how come you weren't in school? Are you sick? Does the family have an issue? You know, can you come back to school? They lost them. And then they said they had a high absentee rate, and high absentee <laughs> rates figure into the performance matrix that they use to decide about closing schools. So this is what was happening at the same time that they were opening these selective enrollment schools. The allegiance of white parents was perhaps driven, or maybe was driven, by what George Lipsitz calls um, a racialized competitive consumerism and for those white parents. And even in, in neighborhood schools and white middle class areas um, and some white working class areas that weren't selective enrollment schools, they were relatively insulated from these broader policies and from the inequities that were happening in the system as a whole. So in 2003, the Commercial Club of Chicago, which was dissatisfied with the, the um, oh, I see your Chicago Teachers Union Solidarity <coughs> shirt. I have one of those. Um, <laughs> um, in 2003, the Commercial Club of Chicago that was, dis was dissatisfied with the pace of, of education reform. So they issued a report called Left Behind, which called for, um, they, actually they said they would love, love to disband public education and just open up a pure voucher system but that was politically unsustainable. So instead they proposed closing neighborhood public schools and expanding charter schools. And in 2004, and actually in 2004, Mayor Daley, at a commercial club of event, club event um, announced Renaissance 2010, which was a policy to do exactly that. Um, and at, I would, so I want to use that time 2004 to talk about the coalescing of a, of a hegemonic alliance and this is where the PowerPoint, the absent PowerPoint comes in. So I'm going to say what it is and try to keep this clear. Um, it coalesced around a market agenda. The, this alliance was led by what the Commercial Club of Chicago, the uh, corporate and financial interests in, in the city, um, the City Club, which is another organization of corporate and financial interests, in collaboration with the mayor. There's a chair up here. Do you want to come up here? You don't have to stand? It's okay. I hate to see you have to stand the whole time. Um, so um, so the, the leadership of this alliance was the corporate financial interests um, allied with the, in alliance with the mayor. It included fractions of capital that um, are the investors in the charter school industry and privatization. This is like the people like uh, Bruce Rauner, who's a hedge fund uh, uh, manager and, and is, um, has a whole plan to invest in charter, in, um, in charter school buildings in, in Chicago. And there are these kind of folks around the country, these Harvard. So these are investors. They're, they don't run charter schools. They're investors. They see the opportunity. They might be investing in something else, soup, for example. But since soup is not all that lucrative, they're into, um, you know, it could be missiles, it could be drones, it could be schools, it's schools. Um, so there, this is a group of investors, okay. Um, uh, another uh, element of this alliance is charter school and uh, school turnaround operators. The people who are running the schools, the chains of charter schools, um, the, um, charter, the turnaround operators in Chicago. A third group are the venture philanthropists, the Gates, the Dells, the Broads, et cetera, who really see Chicago as a laboratory for a lot of these experiments. A fourth group is what Michael calls the new managerial class, the technocrats, the demographers, at the at CPS central office, the people who are in charge of accountability, the people who do the testing, the people who do the professional development to prepare people for the mm. testing, this whole group of technocrats who would not have jobs if it were not for this agenda. Um, and there's a, actually just a swarm of them in the central <laughs> office. Um, the central office has 30 people in the communications department um, whose job it is to uh, produce um, discourses about the Chicago miracle, basically. Um, and another player in this, or another element of this hegemonic alliance, is colleges of education. 
um, who are providing pipelines of teachers and principals to fulfill this agenda. They're, these are not for profit, I'm not talking about for profit colleges, I'm talking about um, public colleges and private colleges and universities that are providing a pipeline for this, including my own on camera. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Can you say that again, Paul? Yes. <laughs> Nobody um, there knows you think this. No, no, that's true, so that's a good thing. Right? Um, this hegemonic um, alliance has other elements in it as well. It really rests on the allegiance of, or um, I don't want to say the allegiance in this case, but the, um, the, the participation of black and Latino charter school parents who, as I just explained before, are responding to the good sense in the, in the market. It also relies on middle class and white parents who are a small but incredibly influential and for the whole city agenda very important fraction of the public school parent group. Um, these are the parents who are the targets of the magnet schools, the specialty schools, and the improved neighborhood schools in white middle class neighborhoods. And it also has relied on the collaboration of the teachers union leadership or the teachers union as a whole, and the national teachers unions who have, that have been complicit in this whole agenda. So that's, if we think about 2004, kind of forward up until, uh, let's say, 2010, that I would say has been what, what this alliance is. Okay, so um, now I want to talk about the present conjuncture and the possibilities of a counter-hegemonic movement and what has kind of happened with this alliance. So over the past two years, cracks have emerged in this alliance. And these fissures open up the possibilities for, for something different. This present conjuncture, I think, is the result of the confluence of the economic crisis, the failures of the neoliberal education policies, and the new social forces that have emerged in Chicago. So this is very particular to Chicago. I want to make that clear. I'm not saying this is what's happening everywhere across the country. This is very particular to this context. But the reason I think it's relevant is because it demonstrates the way in which um, there, it demonstrates the, the crises, the contradictions, the failures of the neoliberal education policies, and it demonstrates how the crisis provides an opportunity, um, although it would look different in different places. So let me go through this a little bit. So the crisis of 2008, as I talked about yesterday, um, precipitated a fiscal crisis of the state, which is both fictive and real. It's fictive in the sense that the money is there. Um, it's real in the sense that since they're not using the money that's there, and since they're not um, relying on the fact that it's actually a financial crisis and a crisis of capital, but instead um, calling it a, a debt crisis, that they're trying mm -hmm. to shift it downward onto um, to most everyone else, including us in this room. So the, the fiscal crisis um, prompted um, CPA, well, prompted the state of Illinois, which as you know, I think is the most in debt fiscal crisis ridden state in the United States. Um, it prompted the state of Illinois to make cuts to uh, cities for education. And this rolled down to CPS, and so CPS um, made um, some broad cuts to music and art and school support staff and increased class sizes in, in, this, in response to the shrinking budget. This infuriated middle class parents on the north side of the city who are, were a key constituency of Mayor Daley and of Mayor Daley's you know, alliance um, and the, a key constituency that he had tried to, rec had tried to recruit to his whole agenda as I um, just explain. So these parents formed a new organization to lobby against the cuts. Initially, they started working with CPS to lobby, you know, the state legislature against the cuts. So that was the first thing. In the second thing is, in the context of the crisis, capital is flocking to education as an investment sector, as I talked about yesterday. So this brought in new actors who accelerated the push for privatization and attacked teacher unions, which is a main obstacle. Then, in 2010, and I'll get, get back to this, I'll return to this again, um, 
uh, teachers in Chicago elected a new progressive leadership of the Chicago Teachers Union. And the union is potentially the most powerful force against this agenda because of its institutionalization, its organization. In 2011, Rahm Emanuel was elected. This is the next factor, okay? And Rahm came in um, determined to make his mark. And uh, with two signature um, initiatives in education. The first was a mandated longer school day. Um, and this is actually a program of Stanford Children, which is a corporate, national corporate school um, group, um, organization funded by billionaires. And um, the idea was to have a longer school day. He claimed Chicago had the shortest school day in the nation, which wasn't true. But um, he claimed to have the, short, the shortest school day. That's why kids weren't doing well. And that if they had more of the same, they would certainly be better. <laughs> and so, therefore, he mandated that kids should have a 7.5 hour school day. And this infuriated not only parents in general, but it not infuriated the North Side middle class parents, but it also infuriated white working class parents on the South Side of Chicago who have been historically the daily and the Democratic Party. Um, apparatus in Chicago, their main base, one of their main bases. So this infuriated them, and they immediately formed two organizations to fight against a longer school day. Um, so that was the, the next thing. And these were parents who were already fed up with too much testing and were already agitated about the whole testing thing. Okay, next thing, this is a PowerPoint, right? Um, next thing was that the other part of Rahm's agenda was a longer school day. The second part was he was going to stick it to the Chicago Teachers Union and this new uppity leadership led by an African-American woman who he, you know, vilified. She's Jewish, too, by the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, so that was interesting. That's interesting, you know, because of Rahm's constituency, and it kind of mixes things up a little bit. But anyway. Um, so in April 2011, Rahm worked with, um, with Stanford Children at, to push through state legislation that would mandate that um, teachers' evaluations, part of teachers' evaluations would be based on student test scores, okay? And they also pushed through a plank that applied only to Chicago, which was that if the teachers were going to go on strike in Chicago, that they would have to have a 75% vote of the, me the voting membership um, to authorize a strike. And Josh Edelman, who um, was the head of STAND, Stanford Children, um, sometimes known as Stand on Children, um, <laughs> <laughs> bragged on camera, you can watch this on YouTube if, if you just Google it, that the CTU, quote, will never be able to muster the votes to strike. In June of 2012, the teachers voted. 90% of all eligible teachers voted yes to authorize a strike. 98% of all those who actually voted, voted yes to authorize a strike. This was a stunning defeat to Rahm Emanuel. Shocking, really. And it reflects the arrogance of power, the sense that ordinary teachers and a teachers union led by Karen Lewis could possibly muster this kind of force, right? And, um, you know, the rest is history, as they say, because as you know, um, in, in September um, of this year, the Chicago teachers um, went on strike. And um, they didn't just go on strike, 100% of the teachers went on strike. And not just the teachers, the paraprofessionals, the school support staff, 100%. There were no staffs. When I came back from, I was on, I shouldn't tell us, I ran out of time, oh God. Um, I, I, was doing, I was doing Democracy Now! the morning of the strike, and it, it was really early, it was horrible. And I came back with um, my friend Rhoda, Ray Gutierrez, we were both on Democracy Now! We were driving back, and we got up Lakeshore Drive, we came off Lakeshore Drive, and we hit Uplift High School, which is a school we know the teachers really well, we've worked with them, they have a, it's a social justice, public school, social justice school, and all the teachers were out on the street. So there was like 70 teachers out on the street in this huge rally and we're waving to them. And then we get to this, the next intersection, this is in our neighborhood now, at, at Western and uh, Lawrence, and there's like 200 teachers on the corner with their signs chanting whatever. And I'm like, Rhoda, 
They're not at the school. What about the scabs? And then we look at each other and we say, there aren't any scabs. They don't have to pick at the school. Mm -hmm. So they, they marched in communities. They demonstrated everywhere. I get to talk about this in two weeks here. I should stop right now. Um, and, and so, um, I mean, this, was, this electrified the city. It really electrified the country. Um, the polls showed the majority of parents, in fact, supported the teachers and not Rahm Emanuel, that they blame Rahm Emanuel and not the teachers. The picket lines were filled with parents and students coming to support the teachers. And so this was really, this is really the, the, these neoliberal policies coming home to roost. Teachers had had enough and parents had had enough. And so they um, really, you know, the, the strike really tapped into um, teachers' deep anger at 17 years of being abused and um, disrespected and um, uh, denied an opportunity to actually teach. Um, and so um, the community organizations of color that have been fighting the school closings, and I'm about to go to them, um, since 2004 were really in the forefront of the, of the, of the union's support stuff. Yeah. Um, the last thing is that in this, con I'm talking about this conjuncture still. I really do need a PowerPoint. So this is a conjuncture of all these factors that a decade of devastating school closings in black and Latino communities has produced a, a um, persistent, militant um, resistance. I'm not calling it a movement. A resistance of African American and Latino parents and community organizations and progressive educators who've been allied with them as a counterpole to Chicago public schools. Not just a resistance, but actually a counterpole. So that now when there's school closing, everybody, all the media want to know what G.T. Brown has to say about it. Not just what Rahm Emanuel has to say about it. So there is this counterpole, okay? Um, and, and, and this is based on all the, the, um, the devastation that these school closings have caused, which I talked about a lot yesterday, and I'm not going to repeat it. You know, there have been pickets, sit-ins, candlelight vi vigils, rallies, um, sit-ins, takeovers, sleep-outs in front of the Board of Education, etc. And they have actually <coughs> produced a counter-discourse about education, which I'm going to get to in a minute. So the conjuncture. So this year, um, Ron, smarting from the, the black eye that he got from the teacher strike, is, um, has come back. And um, he's <laughs> threatening to close over 140 schools. Um, wow. And um, and so that has evoked um, massive turnouts at these sort of phony school closing hearings. Literally several thousand people at mm -hmm. each one. And there have been 37 hearings so oh, far right. around the city. Um, also, CPS's mania for testing has provoked another black backlash. So these same middle class and white parents started a new organization in alliance with the Chicago Teachers Union um, called More Than a Score to fight against all the high stakes testing. So what we have here is a set of policies, failed policies, that their, their failures produce um, a context in, in which with a certain confluence of forces that we have a kind of new kind of configuration. So Colin Lays commented in relation to the twilight years of the Thatcher administration. I think this quote is very appropriate for this moment. For an ideology to be he hegemonic, it is not necessary that it be loved. It is merely necessary that it have no serious rival, end quote. Mm. So what is emerging in the present conjunction in Chicago is the possibility of a counter-hegemonic alternative in education, organizationally and ideologically. The leadership of it is um, a social movement teachers union and black and Latino community organizations that have come, that's the leadership of it, that have come together with white, middle, and working class parents, progressive education organizations, and other school unions. So the middle class and white parents for whom schools had, relatively speaking, been working, suddenly found when they started protesting the, the longer school day and the um, bigger class sizes and the loss of art and so forth, found out they had to arrive at the Board of Education at 6 o'clock in the morning to mm -hmm. uh, stand in line, this is normal, um, to, for four hours, or for two hours to sign in to speak for a meeting that happens at 8 o'clock in the morning. Um, and this is not a decision-making meeting. It's called the public comment period before the doors are closed and they make decisions. And that they found out that the board was not listening to them and they were being disrespected. 
And when they went to the board, they met black and Latino parents who were talking about how they had no elevator in their school and they had uh, kids um, with physical disabilities who couldn't get up and down stairs, that they had no heat, that they had books that were 20 years old. Yes, yes, and they were actually quite shocked about this. Now, we can call this disconscious racism, but they, they were, um, they were um, one, of the, one of the parents said, I was living in a bubble. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you were. But, um, but, but I don't want to dismiss this. I actually want to no. take it very seriously because it has to do with what the possibilities are. Okay. Right. Um, and out of these experiences, an organization of South Side white parents that had come together around fighting for smaller class sizes and and uh, against the the longer school day. Um, and middle class white parents found common cause with black and Latino community organizations um, around a campaign for an elected school board. Now, I, I do not, I think it's really important not to minimize the significance of this. Chicago is iconic for the supposed efficiency of an appointed school board, and the appointed school board is essential to ram through this agenda. So, for Chicago to turn over that, would be really quite significant. And it's a state legislature decision. It's not a decision that's made in Chicago. Um, and a lot of state legislatures totally fed up with what's happening in <laughs> Chicago and they don't want any they don't want to be administering this this thing anymore. So so this is um, so in the summer of 2012 code, Communities Organized for Democracy and Education, which is this coalition, which is a multiracial, multi-class, citywide organization made up of middle and working class white parents, African American Latino organizations, et cetera, et cetera, progressive educators, campaign canvassed door to door. And we won 80%, 87% of the vote in over 300 precincts in 30 of the city's 50 wards for a non-binding referendum for an elected representative school board. And this is, of course, just the first phase of it. Um, right now, um, the, there's a, we're about to introduce a bill in the state legislature. But this vote was a clear signal that CPS <coughs> faces a crisis of governance. Then we had the strike, which elected immediately after that, essentially. So we had the 87% vote. Then we had the strike. Um, and so what we have now is a multi-class, <coughs> multi-racial labor community coalition that includes the people in the code organization plus other organizations that is primarily led by African American and other organizations of color and the Chicago Teachers Union. And, um, and so that's organizationally there is a, now, I am about to say, and I'm going to say about six times, um, I do not want to romanticize this. I do not want to say, oh, you know, this is fragile, it's emergent, it could go many directions, but it's, it is emergent. So that's what I have to say. But it's also not just an organizational challenge, it's an ideological challenge. There are elements of an ideological challenge to the neoliberal hegemony in this. Clark and Newman argue that rather than summoning, and I said this yesterday, but I need to say it again today, rather than summoning alternative cultural forms that do not yet exist, a counter-hegemonic social imaginary might be better developed if we begin by rehabilitating older ways of thinking and doing and building on emergent forms that have been made marginal or framed as unrealistic by dominant discourses. Yes. And so these are ideas like the return of the commons, the dispositions for collaboration, interdependency, etc. And so I think this puts in perspective what's happening in Chicago. So the Chicago Teachers Union has emerged as a social movement teachers union. This is, this is an emergent form. This is as, uh, really borrowed from Latin America. Um, the, the core, the, the caucus that uh, came to power in the CTU, they formed core in the summer of 2008 as a study group. In 2010, they took the leadership of the third largest teachers union in the country. Um, and they, um, they adopted the notion of a social movement union. A social movement union is a, a, a union that's allied with community um, um, around social movements for social justice and itself acts like a social movement in that it's democratic, bottom up, um, mobilized, etc. Um, then there is the citywide coalition, which has um, uh, so the CTU has a program called the Schools Chicago Students Deserve 
that is about a rich curriculum, the arts, social supports, um, critical thinking, um, multiple assessments, real support for teachers and professional development. It explicitly challenges racism, talks about apartheid schools in Chicago. It's not, this is not the Communist Manifesto, <laughs> if you will, or whatever, but it it's directly challenges the, the neoliberal discourses. The, um, the citywide coalition, which is called GEM, Grassroots Education Movement, has these same kinds of planks. Um, the um, African American organizations have initiated um, an agenda called Sustainable School Transformation. This is actually citywide, which is the idea that schools um, should be, trans that rather than closing schools, they should be transformed by the parents and the community involved. And this is really, the kernel of this is really self-determination. Um, um, rehabilitated from the neoliberal agenda, okay? Um, the Chicago Teachers Union's Black and White, uh, their second report, um, challenges privatization. Um, so that as a whole, these forces coalesce around a reinvigorated public. And um, so let me conclude. Um, so what we, let me see. Um, because I'm over time. So no, you don't. You have all the time you want. I can't imagine anybody leaving <laughs> such a, a meeting okay. as this. All right, okay. So I, I don't want to, um, I, I want to leave time for questions. So let me just sum up some of this. So, um, so I think these, these elements comprise both the organizational and the ideological kernels of a potential counter-hegemonic movement in, in Chicago. And, um, you know, um, Jones and Ward say this, I just think it's not their idea, but it's very, they say it very succinctly, that the state must manage competing demands for capital accumulation, legitimation, and social control. I think a few other people have said that, right, Michael? Um, and um, I think Chicago Public Schools right now and the mayor and the, the, the hegemonic alliance are facing a crisis of governance and a crisis of legitimacy when it comes to education. And it really cannot sustain its charter and selective enrollment expansion without imposing massive school closings in black communities um, as well. So since 2008, we've had five CEOs. Um, there's been a churn of staff, departments, interventions, et cetera, uh, known familiarly in Chicago as Chaos on Clark Street, because that's where the central office is located on Clark Street, Chaos on Clark Street. Every teacher, every principal, any parent who's had to deal with CPS can talk about Chaos on Clark Street. <laughs> um, after the strike, um, Emmanuel immediately fired the CEO who he had hired um, to run Chicago schools. And um, he picked Barbara Bird Bennett, who is a, a Broad Fellow, um, who has a, a, a very um, bad history, I'll put it that way. Um, and she came in saying, quote, parents don't trust CPS. So she sort of, you know, ex stated what is, in fact, this crisis of legitimacy. And um, her attempts to reestablish trust have um, not succeeded. Um, as uh, as shown by the thousand, the, you know, a couple thousand people who've been coming out to each of these meetings, and I could talk more about what she's done. The school board is so delegitimated that both the major newspapers came out saying after the referendum that really the school board is dysfunctional and that there should be some kind of hybrid, like maybe we should put a parent or two <laughs> on it. But there, this is this is a cons this is a, a no, but no, I mean that's what they said. We yeah. should put a parent or two on. But it's a concession to a recognition of a crisis of governance, essentially, and, and an attempt to, to deal with that crisis of governance. Um, Chicago Public Schools is on the defensive. I mean, every day they are shifting their tactics, um, basically in response to the, what is happening. So they, they just canceled the, the March 27th board meeting because March 27th is in the middle of uh, spring break. And it was expected to be a demonstration of thousands of teachers and students, mm. right, who weren't in school. And so they canceled the board meeting and rescheduled it for April 3rd. They've never rescheduled a board meeting before. So this is not from a position of strength. This is a, from a position of weakness, clearly. So I am not saying that we are dealing with a very weak enemy here or anything like that. But I am saying that there is, there is a real contestation.
station going on in Chicago, which I, I'm trying to paint a picture of for you. Um, and then the last thing is there is the inherent vulnerabilities of the charter school market. So, um, you know, the cronyism that characterizes Chicago politics fuses with the market strategies to create a particular brand of neoliberal governance in Chicago that has its own vulnerabilities. So UNO, United Neighborhood Organization, Charter School, um, got $98 million from the state, and then they just got another $35 million. They have almost $70 million in debt and a $1.7 million operating deficit. So this is a charter school that is leveraged out, that is, that is um, very vulnerable, and it is a, the biggest and most important charter school organization in the city. Um, the head of UNO was Mayor uh, Daly's um, key Latino ally. He was um, Ram, uh, um, Juan Ron Hell. He was um, Rahm Emanuel's um, campaign finance manager, and he's now been uh, really discredited by all the cronyism that has uh, been exposed. The other major um, charter school operator, Noble Street, fines students for um, if you don't have your shoes tied, five dollars. If you don't have, didn't do your homework, five dollars. So parents have had to pay up to three hundred and four hundred dollars fines um, for their children. So this is, you know, created another huge scandal. So we have the vulnerabilities of these market um, forces also as well. So. Writing in 2009, the late critical geographer Neil Smith commented, we quote, we have, almost all of us, lost the political imagination of a different future. One of the greatest violences of the neoliberal era was the closure of the political imagination. So I think that um, the experience itself of the strike, not what the strike won, but the experience of the strike, the solidarity, the collective power, um, the sense that the city actually could be ours, it actually was ours for a few days, um, that um, the sense that ordinary people could be social actors and, and challenge things um, is awakened a new social imaginary. Now that's obviously in competition with the dominant social imaginary of neoliberalism, which always sucks us back in, you know. But it's, um, it, it reflects sort of the texture, I think, of what's happening. Um, so the reason that I am using Chicago, I'm using Chicago because this is what I know and, and could explain. I couldn't say this about any other context. But the reason I think it's relevant is because um, it does reflect the contradictions of neoliberal strategies and the possibilities of this present social conjuncture. However, neoliberal hegemony rests in part on what George Lipsitz calls a deeply rooted, racialized, quote, social warrant of competitive consumer citizenship that encourages well-off communities to hoard their advantages, to seek to have their tax base used to fund only themselves and their interests, and to, to displace the costs of remedying so complex social problems onto less powerful and less wealthy populations. And neoliberalism has nurtured this ideology, as, we, as I think we all know. And so in this moment of competition for scarce resources, this is really a powerful tool to win the consensus of white people, of middle class people, um, and to exploit the differences. So that's the real danger of the situation, but there's, there are also real possibilities, and that's where I think we're at right now. Well. So long. So as with yesterday, if you'll handle the question, we'll turn yes. it over to folks. Yes. Here. Yes, sir. So you may remember that a couple of years back we did some stuff there in Wisconsin too. Uh, <laughs> you know, the Wisconsin Rebellion was one of the main inspirations for the Chicago Teachers Union. And you know, in a way, it was a big deal. So we had we had mass, you know, wildcat work stoppages. We had the biggest, some of the biggest labor marches in American history, even in a very small state. And we had the longest sustained occupation of the state capital in American history. And during the time, while this was going on and while things were building, those of us who were sort of in the middle of it were getting to feel pretty radical about what we were going to do. Especially if, if the bill failed, for example, the, 
the, the vast majority of the people were sort of really actively involved inside the capital and the teaching, uh, the teaching assistance association, for example, were saying, well, if the bill passes, we're going to go on strike. And certainly there was a lot of talk about that from other people, from people in other unions as well. When it actually came to it, in the end, we did not even publicly discuss in the general meeting the possibility of going on strike. I don't know the details of, of the various other unions, but certainly none of them got very far with any kind of talk about a strike, despite the fact that we actually had this presumably radicalizing process going on while we while we did the protest. So, and and that was sort of the it. I mean, you know, it's taken two years for activism to go back down, down to its normal level of apathy. But that moment sort of took the heart out of things for us. So I'm I'm wondering if you have any insight onto into what went wrong for us, what went right for you. How is it that you know TA needs a two thirds vote to go on strike? There was no chance we would get it, even if we did talk about it. You guys got a 90 percent vote. What? So what? What's the secret? What? What's the? What's different between the two cases? Well, I have to say first of all, I mean, I don't know enough about the Chicago, about Madison, the Wisconsin situation, to, you know, say anything. Um, I wouldn't presume to do that. Um, what I would say is that. Um, um, and what I've read in terms of analyses is that, um, uh, and you should correct me if this is not right, um, but it's my understanding that um, some of the union leadership, some of the unions, their leadership, um, who were very much tied to the Democratic Party, um, diverted um, some of that motion. And um, one thing about Chicago is that it's a Democratic, and this is true of cities, in general. It's the Democratic Party that's doing it to us. So <laughs> there is not the danger in Chicago of diverting the motion into the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party is Rahm Emanuel and his whole apparatus. Um, so that's that's a significant difference right there. Like we're, we're past that, that's one thing. Um, the other thing is that the, you know, the, the, the CTU, um, which, and I, I, I also don't want to glorify it because um, you know, this is a struggle. They inherited a union that was completely demobilized, um, that was um, inept, um, and that was um, bureaucratized, um, and that uh, had been basically complicit in this whole agenda and had not fought. Um, and so they had to, in two years, <laughs> um, you know, and they're still doing this, build a new union uh, on, a, on different grounds. So they're, it is on different grounds. It is this idea of a social movement union, which is, um, which is not the same as, as even good business unionism. Um, so that's another, I think, factor. But you know, I mean, it's possible that the same thing can happen in Chicago. So we have these mass school closings. So far, there have been these hearings. <clears throat> and this is not the, the masses of people that are coming out to these hearings are not being organized by the community organizations. There are too many, and they're all around the city, and there aren't that many community organizations. People are coming out on their own. And we've kind of been expecting people to just take over those meetings. And it's like on the razor edge. But CPS is constantly using its flexible tactics to prevent, kind of prevent that from happening. So we don't know what, it will take very sustained action as it would have in, in Wisconsin to be able to mount um, a contest. And after all, I mean, you weren't just fighting Walker. Um, Wisconsin was a test case for the country, so it, all those forces were poured in. And the same thing is true in Chicago. So <clears throat> I don't know. I mean, we've, I think part of this is that we have, this is just an opinion. It's not based on any research. <laughs> um, I think that we have been absorbing now for so many years, um, not only all these, these um, abusive agendas, but our own powerlessness. That it, um, that's why I think the strike was so significant. People couldn't believe it. I was, so, I was so hoping that we wouldn't have the strike. You know, I mean, I was very involved in, in building support for the strike, but I was hoping that, you know, at the last minute could kind of get 
whatever we're fighting for because it's such a huge risk, especially in, in this moment. And in fact, it was successful. Um, and, but, um, so I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think we are, in a mo we are coming out of a long period and it may take a number of Wisconsins and a number of Chicago's to move beyond it. And that's all I can say, but other people probably have other interpretations. Do you want to respond no, to that? No, I have a different oh, question. Oh, okay. Do you want to say something about what he said? Uh, yeah, sure. I have a question as well. Uh, okay. Because actually, he, he was, he's oh. first on the questions. If it's, sure. I, just, I wanted to turn this into a dialogue, because I, and I don't know if that that's at all helpful, oh. but there's some differences. I'm sorry. Okay, so now I'm going to do it like this. Sir? Oh, okay. I have a I'm not sure I have a question, but I want to get your observations on a couple of things that you said, especially since you ended with uh, with your critique of the UNO Charter School uh, in Chicago. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and so I'd, I'd like you to comment on this emerging in this very fragile alliance, uh, because it seems to me that, that one of the flashpoints in this alliance would be the relationship between the Chicago teachers uh, and, uh, and minority parents. Because uh, because black parents and, and, and Latino parents see the public schools as having largely failed them, uh -huh. uh, and as you yourself right. said, uh, the charter school option is something that's presented to them within a context that's not of their own making. Right. So so I was wondering how you know you know I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the splash point and vulnerabilities of this alliance, given the fact that the schools really have failed minority parents, uh, and, uh, and the Chicago teachers are asking for basically a, a restoration uh, of an old idea that, that you were saying you know, needs to be re-articulated and re-implemented. Re uh, but it seems like it's, it's heading toward a, a, a tragic uh, a collision. Uh, well, um, I, I probably did not do, especially because I was rushing at the end, the best, I, the best job of, um, of describing that situation, because it's actually not quite like that. Um, the, um, the CTU, um, the, the core the caucus that um, won the leadership of the Chicago Teachers Union, the main way they won the leadership of the union was by acting like the union should. Yeah. And so what they did was they were, in 2008, well, in 2000. Sorry. Yeah, 2008 and 2009, and 2000, it would have been 2008, 2009. They were at all these public hearings fighting for these schools, and they. Um, so that's the first thing. So that parents who were fighting the school. So there are different. There di black and Latino parents in the city are not like a, a mass, right? They're highly differentiated. There are um, black parents and Latino parents who are sending their kids to getting their kids into these magnet schools. Okay. Um, there, and there are um, parents who are opting for charter schools, um, not only because the public schools have failed them. In some neighborhoods, there aren't any public schools left. They don't even have that. To, you know, it's like we've got to find a charter school because there's so many schools have been closed. So there are various reasons why people are doing that. And then there are parents who are fighting for their schools. It's black and Latino parents who are fighting for their schools. And so that's the first thing. The second thing is that the CTU has, um, they have really tried to take a very strong stance against racism. They have taken the stance that public schools are failing kids and that the right. public schools need to be reinvigorated and rehabilitated. So they're actually siding with the parents. Now that doesn't mean every parent is hearing them or agreeing with it and there is a whole history. But so it, that's the second thing. It's not as if we just have the same relationship between the CTU and the parents that we had four years ago. That, that's actually much more mixed at this point. Um, and then there was another thing I wanted to say about that. Oh, um, so the parents who are fighting for their schools, I think we have to understand, and I said this yesterday, the complexity of these schools. So yes, we have disinvested schools that stripped of resources, that are not serving children well, we have racist teachers, we have all the things that reproduce inequality, we have all the things that we know. But you know when you go to these hearings and people are fighting for their schools, they're, they're not saying our school is great, they're saying we want to improve our school. Parents are saying that, students are saying that, teachers are saying that. They are saying, but this school is an anchor in the community. My parents went here, my parents went here, my grandparents went here. This is the only stable thing we have in the community. This is a space where we have adult education classes, whatever, whatever, that's going on there. And every school has its components of good and bad, if you will. 
It's so much more complicated than, you know, good schools, bad schools. They have a, what I would call a bad curriculum, and then they have a great arts program, and they have a great science program, but the rest of the reading pro or whatever is not good. Or it's, you know, there, there are differentiations among the teachers. So um, it's a more fluid situation than that. And, and it can go any way. And there is a long history of con contradictions between parents of color and schools. But the schools that are being closed, the schools that are being closed have, um, this is where we're losing our black teachers. Mm -hmm. The black teacher, the percentage of black teachers in Chicago has declined drastically because of school closings. Now, not that every black teacher is an ally of black students and their communities, but these they, you know, these are the teachers who are allies, and, and we're losing that. So it's more complicated, if that helps. Yeah. To go back to your beginning and look for another contrast. Mm -hmm. um, the beginning, you said Chicago is a great laboratory, but you don't know how far it's going to generalize. Mm -hmm. uh, the right. contrast mm -hmm. I'm making in my mind goes back to 1968 through early 70s, when. Uh, some of us can remember that. Uh, uh, when the community control movement in New York yes. was uh, yes. transformed into a decentralization movement. Uh, and the key difference there was the union and the community were at odds. Yes. So if you put that at one end and you put what you've described at the other right. end, do you know enough about other cities, big cities, to say anything about what we should expect or can expect when, well, you, when those are sort of ideal type yeah. possibilities? I think that, um, well, probably the answer, the real answer to that question is no. <laughs> but um, <laughs> what, what I would say about it is, because uh, I don't want to talk about things I really, really do not know about, um, I think that. Um, There was a confluence, which I tried to describe, of factors that really allowed the CT, the allowed core to gain leadership. What it reflected is that New York aside, New York is the headquarters of the AFT. They've got all their forces marshaled there, essentially. So New York is like the biggest nut to crack. So leaving that aside for a minute, other cities, um, is that um, what it shows is that there's a vacuum. It's leadership by default in terms of the teacher unions and their, their, their failures to connect with communities. That there is a, there is a possibility because of, of the failure for um, other forces to step in. So what we are seeing emerging is, I mean, um, folks in the CTU are, I for one, and I'm not in the CTU, uh, you know, um, I'm talking in a lot of different places about the strike because everybody wants to know about it. But folks in CTU are just being called to city after city by caucuses that are asking them, tell us, you know, mm -hmm. about. And of course, I think everybody kind of wants a, a formula, like how'd you do it and, you know, how should, what can we do kind of thing. And every context is very different, so there, there is no formula whatsoever. But um, there is certainly the potential for that, you know, and uh, of, of these kinds of things to emerge. But it does take the right confluence of factors, which in Chicago, I didn't say this, and I should have said this is really, really important. CORE came out of the struggles of the African American and Latino parents fighting the school closings. So it was, they were teachers who were allied with those parents fighting the school closings already. And they built CORE out of that. So, um, so this is a, a specific, you know, kind of situation. Um, so I, do, I don't know enough about how far along in this sort of spectrum other cities are. But I, I do think the situation is, is certainly much more fluid. Um, if teacher unions are under attack. I mean, whether they're even going to be teacher unions. I mean, Philadelphia, forget it, you know? Detroit, forget it, you know? Um, so, um, yeah. Could we have a female voice? Thank you. It's women's history. I'm 
interested in what was happening on college campuses and not knowing this information. Um, and so I'm interested in what, how have you seen, I guess, in Chicago examples of college students and their um, solidarity with these movements and not mm -hmm. more glamorous mm -hmm. teacher alternatives or education mm -hmm. programs? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that's a good question. So, um, in Teachers and Social Justice, we we just helped build uh, an organization called um, Students for Educational Justice. Mm -hmm. Students for Education Justice, and it's teacher education students at a number of campuses. And actually, the way that it started was um, that um, one of the people in TSJ um, <clears throat> raised the issue of. So Stanford, uh, no, Democrats for Education Reform. It's hard to keep all these. This is another billionaire uh, mm -hmm. corporate reform group, uh, Democrats for Education Reform. They started a student, student group. I guess you know this, C for, or S for, or whatever, mm -hmm. Students for Education Reform. And, and so at one of the campuses, you know, they're recruiting students. And it's kind of like TFA in the sense that they're recruiting students who are good-hearted, well-meaning. Um, they want to make a difference. And, you know, and then this group comes along and says, you can make a difference and join us and whatever. So they decided, we need to bust this up and, you know, kind of like tell people what's really going on. So they started this organization, and I think there's like six campuses or whatever right now. Um, been meeting, we're having a forum on tomorrow um, at Northeastern Illinois University. Um, it's kind of taking off. Um, and um, the group was... Um, uh, began to form at the, our, our annual conference, the Teaching for Social Justice Conference in November. Um, and they have allied with students. And stu high school students are organizing across the city um, against the school closings, uh, whether their school's being closed or not. And so we've had several meetings of high school students, um, you know, from 30 high schools. Um, so the, the, the university students are aligned with the high school students. So there is an attempt to do that, yes. And, you know, um, they, they want to go beyond the K-12 stuff, too. Because what's happening to K-12 education is what's happening to higher education, yep. you know? Um, and so um, they're, they're seeing the connections and wanting to make the connections. So, yes. Uh, yeah, Kyle, you had your hand up before. Do you want to say something? Yeah. Um, when it is a strike that success? From what I hear about Chicago, the education of black kids on the west and south side and the brown kids <coughs> is not improved. That's right. It basically remains <coughs> at the same point that it is. So when is a strike a success? And when do we, and how can we claim when the purpose of education is really for the kids in that classroom. So, and so that's kind of uh, one comment. The second comment would be, given the context of, of things that are going on, if Harold Washington was mayor, hmm. this bear with me, <coughs> how would you see and interpret <coughs> these things if he was in the same situation? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, in response to the, the first half of your question, um, you know, that's been discussed a lot, and many people have raised that. And Karen Lewis um, said, um, and, and has said, um, that um, the strike was um, just round one. And of course, it's not really round one. It's, there were other rounds before that. It's just round one. Um, so when we say, was it a success? In what sense was it a success? It didn't, it did not change much in, in schools. That's absolutely right. Nor could it have, nor could it have. We are battling back from, first of all, decades and decades of racism and inequality in schools. And we are battling back from three decades, two decades of all these neoliberal policies. And so, what happened in Chicago is that, and when we say, well, what did the teachers win? You know, it depends on how you look at it. From the standpoint of contract bargaining or something like that, well, maybe not so much, you know. Um, but from the standpoint of building 
up a kind of movement that can fight for those things that you're talking about. It was a critical victory. It showed that we could fight back against the system. What the picket, what the picket signs were, so CTU was con constrained to striking over, this was part of all this legislation, over wages and working conditions. They couldn't strike over class size, lack of art, music, gym. They couldn't stri strike over inequities in the system. All they could strike over was this very narrow thing. So what you saw was the official signs. And then you saw all the other signs carried by teachers, many teachers and parents that were, we want art, we want music, we want smaller class sizes, we want equity, we want an equitable system, we want, you know, all these things that, that are needed. So there, I think we have to have a, it's, I think we have to have a protracted view. I, we can, we can, could not have won that in a strike. If they had lost that strike in the sense of been beaten by Rahm Emanuel, <laughs> that they, we would be not in any position to fight for those things. In, mm -hmm. We're in a much better position to fight for those things now. And, um, and so they went, the, you know, they, they led a strike um, for seven days. They went back with their organization intact, um, having won things that no teachers union in the country has won because every, every, every contest has ended in concessions and defeats. And they stood up and, and showed that it could happen. So that's where it's at. Um, and, and so that would be my response to that. So that takes a certain kind of, of um, perspective, I guess, to look at it that way. But I think it is the only, was the only, um, it was the best possible outcome of a situation which is essentially a sort of, uh, you know, fighting back from a, a, a very um, historically defeated position. The Harold Washington thing is a really interesting question. <laughs> and um, um, boy, I'd have to think about that a lot. But um, so there's talk, I'll put it this way. There's, there is now much going on in Chicago about the next mayoral election <laughs> and mounting a real opposite, not another blah, politician who's, you know, not another older person kind of thing, but not another um, whatever. But, um, but to actually um, mount uh, a progressive opposition. Um, and uh, everyone's talking about the Washington administration. And everyone's, ta and, you know, everyone's talking about that kind of coalition or whatever. And, and so I think that is on people's minds. And I think that um, such an administration would be an administration that would have um, the, the alliance that it would have built would have been an alliance with the teachers union. Um, and with the, the parents and so forth. So it would be a, a different contest. Um, and that, you know, remains to be seen. So. Uh, I know that some people have child care responsibilities and other responsibilities. So while I know there's other questions that are remaining, I think we have to be honest about other responsibilities that people have. Uh, let me remind you that uh, there'll be an informal seminar tomorrow. Uh, it's at 1220. And it's in 8108, uh, across the way. I did it right this time. Uh, and uh, with Pauline. So uh, again, I just want to uh, thank Pauline very much.